Well, Robert doesn't know, but uh, I'm, I'm an urban jungle kind of kid. I, I grew up with a lot of asphalt and concrete, and that's where I feel comfortable. <laughs> I'm just accommodating grass. <laughs> so, bats, that's one thing. Now we get to slugs and creepy crawlies, and here is another guy who's insanely happy about the work that he does. It's Jules Howard, he's a zoologist, he's a, a paleontologist, uh, he's, he's a writer, he's a very droll writer, and I'm pleased to welcome him to our stage. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Really nice to meet you all. Um, I still can't really believe that I've been invited to give a talk about slugs, of all things. I've been talking about all sorts of different kinds of animals. This is the first. We've flown across the world to talk about um, slugs. Uh, so, yes, I'm going to take you on a, I'm gonna take you on a, a bit of a, a kind of whistle-stop tour. Um, I had a, like a Damascus moment with slugs. Um, about two years ago. Uh, and I'm going to tell you the story about this Damascus moment with slugs. Some of you are thinking, oh, well, this is going to be horrible. Uh, there's, there's a kind of happy ending to it, and I think by the end you'll be, quite, you'll be quite hardy, you'll be quite resistant to sort of like scoffing and rolling your eyes at invertebrates, at things like insects, um, but especially slugs. So, uh, so, yeah, the story starts. The story starts, I was researching at the time a book about um, animal sex, and I decided, I'm not sure, this probably says a bit too much about me, but I decided every time I saw any animals having sex, I would quickly get my camera out, my phone, and try and video it, just because it just, it just felt right at the time. Now I'm here talking about it, it feels strange. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so that was the plan. Uh, and I was in my garden. Some of you, do we have any, does anyone know about slug sex? Do we know about this, anyone? Okay, this is good. One, two, two deviants in the crowd, this is good. <laughs> Uh, it's quite unusual sex, and they both have a kind of a, what you might call a, a vagina and a penis, and they're hermaphroditic, and they fertilize one another, they form a beautiful spinning, a sort of like sex trapeze of slime. So I was like, this is going to happen. I was in the garden, in the backyard, this is really going to happen. Wow, there's two slugs, and they're readying for sex. So I got my uh, phone out, and I videoed it. So this is the video of that, and hopefully it'll work, and I'm going to talk you through it. Okay, good, it's working. Okay, so we have two slugs. And I thought they were having sex, but actually, uh, it's more grotesque than that. They're actually eating a third slug in the middle. So there's a dead slug, and now there's an ant. Um, and these slugs, are, and I thought, oh, well, that's fair enough. I'll just watch them eating the other slug. And they're so, I mean, I, even I find that a bit disgusting. But, you know, they're there, and now look, something white comes out. Something runs across the top of the slug. And I think, well, what is that? And it runs into the pneumostone. This, this is the, the lung, if you like, of a slug. And I thought, what is going on there? And I sat and watched, and five or six of these tiny little creatures running around on both of the slugs. In fact, they were traveling from one slug to the other. And I thought, this is just insane. And I thought, I have to know what that animal is. And I have to know about its, obviously, I have to know about its sex life. So I thought, you can see it there creeping around. I thought, wow. So I decided instead to look at the animal that lived on the slug, and it took me to an interesting place. Now, obviously, those uh, sort of zoology freaks out there, you'll know this is, this is, this is a mite, of course. Um, and mites are incredibly interesting. Mites are, I mean, mites are incredibly kind of diverse. If you think about the tree of life, okay, the wonderful evolutionary tree of life, most of the animals you can see there are habitats for mites. So most of the animals there, there are, you know, mites that live up the nostrils of chimpanzees, mites that live in kangaroo pouches, mites that live bat genitalia. I don't know where Robert's gone, but, you know, there's a mite species that lives in bat genitalia. Uh, and, of course, there is two mite species on us right now. What, mm, face mites, uh, microscopic mites. Having sex on your face right now, which is kind of... <laughs> Strange thought when you think about it. <laughs> Sorry, I had to go there. Um, so yeah, you 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 look at mites, and what you see is diversity. They, you know, they're quick breeding. They uh, can evolve incredibly quickly, and they evolve to suit the habitat, the animal, if you like, on which they live. So they're really, really, really incredible. The fastest animal in the world for its size 
uh, is a mite. Cheetah can run something like 16 body lengths um, a second. Mites can run 300 body lengths a second. So they can, that's like me running 1,000 miles an hour. And they're the strongest animals for their size. They're kind of interesting and a, a, little, bit, uh, a little bit weird, I suppose, like me. Um, now, this is just an example of the diversity of mites. So these are feather mites. These are mites that basically live on the, on the feathers of South American um, birds. And this is just, I mean, these are just some of the pictures. The whole, the whole poster, um, a guy called uh, Hernandez in Brazil has sent me a whole poster. It looks like the world's weirdest dishcloth. But it's really, really, I mean, you can see there, there's whips and there's hooks and there's claws. Uh, an amazing amount of diversity. And they're all doing the same thing, they're just living on birds' feathers. So there is a world of these animals out there. And I had to find out what mine was. What was the animal on the slug? I took a bit of searching, but I found it. It's this. Uh, no one's particularly interested in this animal. Uh, it was first described in 1946 by a, um, a British uh, acarologist, a mite studier. Um, and the story goes, Frank Turk is his name, the story goes that after World War II, he was stuck in bed, he was wounded, he was stuck in bed in Italy. And I, I don't know this, but I like to imagine him sort of just saying, just find me any animals to study. And someone's obviously bought him some snails and some slugs, and he's written this beautiful monograph uh, with these lovely little pictures. So that's, you know, that's the animal, brilliant. On to uh, the sex lives of this animal. Now, my sex lives, I mean, if I showed you this picture just now, the vo the, we think of mammals as being so varied and so interesting, and reptiles too. Um, but actually, mites have all of these sexual, I suppose, sexual shenanigans. They do all of these sexual behaviors, if you like. So there are mites that have like harems, there are mites that battle with one another, there are like peacock versions of mites that are sort of showing off to each other. There are mites that kind of have sex with their brothers and sisters, or they eat them, or there are mites that are born inside their mothers that then eat them. There is just an unbelievable amount of variety in terms of sex. So I thought, okay, this is fine. I'm going to find out about the sex lives of this animal. And I studied, and I looked around, and I looked, and I looked, and I looked. I was hoping it might be a sex life like the velvet mite. Hands up, you see these in gardens. So hands up, has anyone ever seen these? You will remember this animal now. It create, in our gardens, without us ever knowing, it creates, the males create a little garden um, of sperm vases. So they sort of create these little vases of sperm, and then they stand around, and when a female comes along, they oh, look at my garden. And they show them, <laughs> here's one, and they sort of go, oh, yes, yes, mm, yes, no, look, there's more, there's more. And it's just a wonderful, I mean, these obviously don't have brains. But you're looking at an animal which is capable of doing all sorts of uh, behaviours we would be like, wow, that's quite impressive. And apparently as well, uh, well to, to me, to you, um, there is also the cool thing about this is, so you imagine the male and he's going, yes, yes, visit, visit. While he's showing the female the various vases of his sperm, other males can come in and sort of go... <laughs> like that and just leave and swap their own sperm vases for the other ones. So they're basically making a sex garden. <laughs> Uh, in our gardens, a miniature sex garden we've never even noticed or cared about, and there are mites out there doing crazy things. So back to my slug mite. Back to my slug mite. So the slug mites, uh, the closest I could get, this is the most amazing thing. We know slug mites can impede the development of slugs. We know that they lay, slugs lay fewer eggs when they're infected. We know they live in the lungs, so they live in that little hole. And we know that slug mites run up and down slime trails. So in other words, they can go, this is new slime, I'm going to head towards the object of my affection. But do we know about their sex? Do we? Heck, we don't know at all. This is the closest there is. You're looking at the closest we've ever come to understanding the sex lives of this mite. Now, I need to remind you, some of you are thinking, oh, it's just this crazy Brit, and he's got slug mites in his garden. Slug mites are in your garden. Slug mites are in every, pretty much most slugs at this time of year that you've ever seen or rolled your eyes at. This is a world for slug mites. And we don't know how they have sex. We don't, there's a little sucker you can see there where it says SD. This is a little sucker that's on the male, so it might insinuate that maybe sometimes they, males carry females around and let them mature, and when they're ready to have sex, they then have sex with them. So it could be something like that. The truth is we just kind of don't know. We talked 
a lot about big data. I've absolutely loved this, this the idea city. It's been just fantastic. We talked a lot about big data. <laughs> this is like no data. This is the opposite of that. <laughs> And like, it's really easy to get, I mean, I was getting pulled into the world of big data, and I think I almost know what it is now. And it's like, wow, the world's an incredible place. But actually, when it comes to invertebrates, it's actually a complete mystery, a lot of it. And there's a lot of parts of invertebrates that are really interesting and mysterious, and that we have still yet to explore. The dark, it's like the dark side of the moon. Invertebrates are like the dark side of the moon. So you look at things like spiders and the sex lives of spiders that are going, you know, these are in our houses, are incredibly complicated for reasons we don't really understand. I'm going to show you a picture. This is a great picture. It's like a, a, a cheat sheet for how to have sex if you're a spider, okay? <laughs> and there will be a test. That is the cheat sheet for how to have sex if you're a spider. An animal with no proper brain that has to make sure all of those, it's like your worst nightmare. I thought sex as a human was pretty hard, but you know, the idea of leaning in, swiveling abdomen, scraping pouts, engaging embolus. Um, <laughs> did I just act that out? I think I did. I don't, I won't be, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, incredible, incredible variety, and probably every spider has its own unique, uh, you know, script, I suppose, that it has to go through. Um, and we only know a few of them. We only know a few of them. You think about things like, most animals, a lot of debate at the moment about why so many insects have a larval stage. You know, why our gardens are infested often with larval stages. Why that seems to work. And we don't really know the answers to that. We're <laughs> completely um, stumped, I suppose, in a lot of ways when it comes to invertebrates. Another classic, you know, is the idea of how many species there are on planet Earth. I think we may, we may never actually know that, because some of the animals are tiny. So this is a, a type of wasp, a family of wasps called fairy wasps, fairy flies. Um, that's, that's like the size of one on the bottom right. And next to it is a paramecium. And next to that is an amoeba. So these flies are, are smaller or the same size as single-celled organisms, and they're flying around all over the place. Do you think we know how many there are? We don't have a clue. There could be thousands. There could be thousands of different species of wasps that we will never get the chance to see or, or have a look at. So the slug mites thing, it's kind of, uh, you know, I thought I knew about animals, and I didn't. You know, I really honestly thought we know so much about animals, there are no mysteries yet to find. And uh, I found one in, 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 you know, my backyard. You, you have these animals in your backyard as well. Now, compare that to vertebrates. I'm not pitching like an invertebrate versus vertebrate kind of zoological war. But, you know, the idea of vertebrates, in some ways, we know more about them. You know, going back to the big data theme, you know, you can track great white sharks moving with apps on your phone, moving through the oceans. We just heard about this absolutely awesome. That back detector phone app was absolutely amazing. It was brilliant. That's, that's, kind of, that's where we are with vertebrates. We're collecting data on an awesome scale. We can track and conserve you know, megafauna, big animals of Africa, using drones, using satellites. We can see what's going on at the bottom of the sea. We can see how long it takes to decompose a whale. We can understand the extinction events of life on Earth. We can read the history of the Earth in rocks. We can understand about things like herpes in Neanderthals. We can understand that we gave Neanderthals herpes. We live in this world of information which gives this kind of illusion, this illusion that we know everything, that we know everything. Now, I spend a lot of my time working um, with young people and, and teachers. And I don't know how it is in Canada. In Britain, we have a kind of exam system that it's changing, but we have an exam system where Basically, with, sometimes with science, it's a case of young people learning facts, sort of regurgitating facts that scientists discovered 100 years ago, and they're rewarded points. You know, good grades come to those that can recite the facts of scientists that lived um, in the past. And I don't know, it's a personal opinion, but I, I think it gives this illusion that we kind of know everything, that there's no point in investing yourself in science, because we know kind of all the answers already. You can't make your name, you can't kind of make a name for yourself 
um, as a scientist because you're always going to be treading in someone else's footsteps. The slug mite, the slug mite represents that, I suppose. It represents that anyone in this audience, and I implore at least one of you, could go home and in a year become a global expert in the slug mite. And they have, they have, who knew, but they have like mite conferences every five years. The last one was in Brazil. You know, in five years' time, you could be giving a keynote. Genuinely, I actually mean this. You could be giving a keynote speech about the genitalia of slug mites. What happens inside that hole? <laughs> what happens inside that hole? <laughs> Do we have any Carl Sagan fans in the audience? Hands up. OK, I'm a big Carl Sagan fan. For me, it's like, you know, pale blue dot. Look at that hole. <laughs> everyone you know and everyone you love. <laughs> it's not quite like that. But it's, you know, that, what you're looking at there is the boundary of human knowledge. What you're looking at there is a whole list where there is unknowns, I suppose. Unknowns that can be genuinely reached. Unknowns that can be scaled. Um, and careers can be made out of stuff like that. Not necessarily high-paid careers, I'll be totally honest. <laughs> But careers can be made uh, out of stuff like that. So invertebrates are, they are kind of awesome, I suppose. Um, and I think I'll be doing a book signing upstairs. So if any secret invertebrate fans or anyone wants tips on how to get inside this mysterious big hole that's on the screen, uh, then please do give me a shout. But thank you again, Moses and Connie, for having me. Thank you, guys.